Hideki Sato was one of the leading hardware developers at Sega during its heyday, and even served as president of the company between 2001 and 2003, which saw them exit the hardware industry and become a third party developer. Whilst he was a massive force at Sega for much of its gaming history, he is not a celebrity figure in the West in the same way that many at Nintendo are, and most gamers have probably never heard of him. That is why it's so amazing that last year he did a gigantic oral history interview with the Ritsume Ken Center for Game Studies at the Hitotsubashi University in which he discussed his past of Sega and the gaming industry, but also gave away plenty of interesting pieces of history about Sega that were not really known before now. My friend Yoren that's been on my channel before is translating this document, so huge respect to him for undertaking this. I'm doing a bigger video about lots of what he said in the document at a later stage, but I wanted to focus on a small snippet of what he said in this video, because I think it gives an incredible insight into the mindset of the gaming industry in the 90s and early 2000s, which I was never personally aware of. I'm going to read the whole statement out and then comment on it afterwards. To give some context, he had just finished discussing the issues Sega had with EA in the 90s, not wanting to pay licensing fees for the Mega Drive. He also mentions Nakayama, who was the president and CEO of Sega from 1983 to 1999. Because the Genesis did very well in America, Sega of America wanted to make some games of their own. They got some people together, maybe a couple hundred, and started developing games. Plenty of stinkers, but they made them. Titles kept coming out, although most of them never made much of a splash. In contrast to Nintendo and later Sony, it made it look like Sega would greenlight anything, but I think they were also glad that they were producing their own games. EA mostly made sports games, and they were really good at it, like NFL or NBA games. Those kind of sports, like the Major League, were very popular in the US, and Sega wouldn't have been able to make as good a job of that themselves. EA had a strong hold on the sports section, with their licensing contracts with the NBA and NFL, etc. Japanese third party companies, especially Taito, Namco, or Konami, I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but they really didn't like Nakayama. And if what they made were to benefit Nakayama, they didn't want to be a part of it. Therefore, a lot of Japanese third party companies didn't make games for us. Up to the 16 bit generation was the cartridge era. During this time, Japanese game development was really strong. As for why, it's because Japan is Japan. And this is just my own theory, but 130 million of us Japanese share this cramped space. 13 million being in Tokyo. Trains run full to the brim of people, and the people live together in peace and quiet. America, on the other hand, which is many times bigger than Japan, maybe 10 times bigger, and their population is around 240 million. What does this have to do with games? Well, games in the 16-bit generation were made onto computer chips, right? In these chips or ROMs, all the game's story, graphics, music, and everything else had to be crammed onto them. We had to work really hard to make the very most of the space we had available, to get as much information in there as we possibly could. It's kind of like our houses here in Japan. Our apartments, apartment complexes, our full trains. In those small spaces, to get as much in as possible while still working together, that's Japan's speciality. If the sound isn't within a certain amount of kilobits, it can't be put in, that kind of thing. If it's not under a certain amount, it can't be put in. But nowadays, Japanese game development is suffering, although there are standouts. But when the CD-ROM era came around, the 4 megabit or even specially made 16 megabit were no more. Now we had 540 megabytes to use. My example would be, say I had 30 Subo or 50. I could build a nice house, even add a veranda to it. I can imagine what I would do with that area, but I have 5,000. I can do whatever I want with it. Or hey, why not 10,000? So what to do with all that space? I can't imagine. That's far removed from the Japanese lifestyle. Here's where I think the American viewpoint started to become more effective. Within the 16-bit generation, we went from the MC68000 to RIC CPU. The calculation power got substantially better, we had more memory to work with, and the speed was up, which was good. But that way, the Japanese skill of meticulously working details and working a lot of data into a small space, there was progressively less need for that. This is a point of view that I have never heard before. The idea that Japanese developers are better at smaller, more focused games, and therefore were better at games on the older systems, and by consequence, better at getting more out of a little, purely because of their lifestyle and culture, is fascinating to me. It's very difficult to put a finger on exactly why games made in different countries can be so different, and everyone has their own theories about it, 
but I think this is quite an interesting one and I just wanted to share it with everyone on my channel. What do you think? What do you guys think is the reason that there is such a difference between Japanese and American games? I do agree with Hideki in so much as Japanese games were better in the 16-bit days and American developers certainly seem to produce better open world games. However, I think as time goes on, that difference that he has mentioned has changed slightly and it isn't so readily apparent anymore. But it is certainly interesting to look at it in the mindset of late 90s gaming. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and if you like this little tidbit of gaming history, please be sure to subscribe. Goodbye!